Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13, 14 clearly states that the angels uh, were created to serve humanity, the only receptors of the sacrifice of Christ. It says that we would be the heirs of salvation. Now, of course, <clears throat> to explain to uh, this, talks about we shall be the inheritors of salvation. Salvation comes in three, three parts. Now, this is a whole different uh, field of theology, soteriology, uh, that I don't want to get into right now, but I just want to mention it. Uh, uh, just as God created man in his image, part of that image, a part of that image, we're going to see on the sixth day when we get, when we get there in this, in this study, is that uh, this image uh, of, this, of, the, uh, of God this, that w in which we were created is that as God is a, tree, a trinity, I believe in the trinity, uh, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, man is also a, a trinity. Uh, he is spirit, soul, and body, in that order. Spirit, soul, and body. And our salvation comes to each one of those in its time. When you receive Christ, when you repent of your sin and come to a saving encounter in Christ, your spirit is saved immediately. You are born again. Nevertheless, your soul, the, uh, the restoration, the healing, and the salvation of your soul occurs over a period of time. Yes, you are saved, but it occurs, it develops, and it matures, and it grows. And this is what we call sanctification. This is working out your salvation. You don't work for your salvation. But this is following the steps of Christ to become uh, a, a representative of Christ. Not politically, not just so people can see. No, this is Christ in you, the hope of glory and fulfilling your purpose in Christ. All that is a matter of development. This is why, this is one of the reasons why Christ saved you. He saved you because he loves you. But he loves everybody else too. And so he wants you to be as what the, what the Bible calls ambassadors for Christ. And that's Christ being developed in us. That's sanctification. And that's working out. That's part of that where our entire life, we're growing, we're developing in this salvation. This is being saved. Uh, and so like, uh, because we are saved, we will continue to work. That's just a natural part of this new creature. He'll, this is what you do because it's in you to do it. Just like breathing is natural. Wanting to honor and please God is organic within us. We want to love God. We want to uh, please Him. We want to do that. Which, whether anybody's looking at us or seeing us or not, we want to glorify God and please and honor Him. That's part of your salvation. That's part of you working that out and growing in Christ. Now, the third part is the Bible says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so... We're going to have to shed this mortal body and that one day we will be saved because this body is going to resurrect and we will be with Christ. That's the third part of salvation, which makes the whole salvation journey complete. And so uh, there is that. So we, we, we have to take a look at all those details. That's the trinity of salvation. Uh, it's not that you're not completely saved from the beginning and any part of that development of your salvation here on earth. I mean, Christ knows where you are and he's... And he's, he's going to take you. He's going to, but there's still that growth in Christ and working out your salvation with fear and trembling. So, uh, so we're the only receptors of the sacrifice of Christ. There's no other creature on the earth or in all of creation uh, that we know of as far as uh, our salvation. But Christ dying for us, uh, he didn't do it for the animals as much as we love animals. And as much as I love nature, he didn't, he didn't die for the beauty of nature. He, he Christ gave his life and sacrificed himself for us. That's the pinnacle of the creation story. So, point of clarification. The entire purpose and the zenith of the Toledot, uh, that story, that development in Genesis chapter 1, of the generations it talks about, it mentions that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4, of, the tole, of this Toledot, uh, is the creation of mankind. That's what it's coming down to. That's the reason for the story, the reason that Christ had to come to earth, born of a virgin and clothed in human flesh. Uh, it comes down to that part. So he created those angels for that. Now, why do I mention that? 
I see, therefore, that everything in Genesis 1 is done in preparation to receive the proposed crown of God's creation, whose creation began in Genesis 1.26. And God said, let, let us make humans in our image and our likeness and let them rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the domestic animals all over the earth, and all the animals that crawl on the earth. And so, uh, I mentioned in our second study that... Uh, that on the first day God created light. So in Genesis chapter uh, uh, 1, verses 3 to 5, informs us that God created light on the first day. Nevertheless, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 19, like I, we have read, God created the stars on the fourth day. Now, I present to you that the creation of the stars includes the creation of the angels. Now, follow me with this. So, Dr. Parker, where'd you go? We're talking about stars, yes, but follow me with this. If angels were created to serve man, not because of some leftover part of another creation that was destroyed, as Dr. Chalmers presented, no, but were created for us, to be our servants, as Hebrews chapter 1 uh, uh, states. I believe that in preparation for the creation of mankind, God also created humanity's servants, the angels, on the fourth day. Let me explain. The Bible tells us that Adam knew Lucifer as a non-fallen angel in Eden. Eden. Hmm. So where do we see this? Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation on the king of Tyrus. Now, the king of Tyrus, there was a physical king of Tyrus, but actually he's not talking about a human being. He's talking about the power that controlled this king of Tyrus. Tyrus. He was so open to Lucifer that he was controlled by Satan. Satan is not omnipresent. He can only be in one place at a time. And he's going to find the ambience that is most propitious for his purposes. And so you'll find several places in the Bible that talks about there was the throne of Satan. Uh, and it's in different cities. They have their territories that they can control and dominate. The Bible tells us as individuals not to give any place to the devil. So there are entire kingdoms and governments and people and neighborhoods that give so much place to the devil that and in a smaller uh, 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 way, in a lesser way in, or in a, a smaller realm of authority, demons can control a certain neighborhoods or, or certain cities or, or certain kingdoms or certain nations. Uh, have more control than others. That doesn't mean there's not a people of God there, but uh, the majority of the power that controls and runs the place are dark spirits. So uh, it says here, we're talking about the king of Tyrus. And say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This is talking about Lucifer before he fell. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, Okay, you were in Eden. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou wast created. In other words, he's a created being. Thou art the anointed cherub. We know, yeah, at this point, we're not talking about the king of Tyre. We're not talking about a human being. We're talking about a spiritual being. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Now, I've talked to different theologians in different parts of the globe, brilliant uh, uh, scholars and colleagues, and None of us know what the stones of fire are. And uh, we've even all suggested, well, are these stones of fire? Are we talking about different stars, different solar systems? He was able to travel throughout the universe. We can only speculate. Uh, but we don't know what the stones of fire are. He wasn't fallen then in this part of uh, his creation, in this part of his story. So he's not talking about hell. He's not talking about Hades or anything. That, or nothing that was prepared for him. That's in it hadn't been prepared yet because there was no fall. Here comes the fall. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till, that is 
until iniquity was found in thee. That's, that's Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 to 15. Now, if you read that, you find Lucifer in the Garden of Eden before he was a fallen creature. Before he was a fallen creature. This is long after those uh, Genesis verses 1 and 2. So, yes, he was there. Adam and Eve knew him, not as some demonic evil character. They knew him as God's servant, an angel of God. Angels are almost always referred to as stars, as we will notice. It's interesting that angels are referred to multiple times, both in the Old and New Testament, as stars. In Judges, chapter 5, mentions the stars as being involved in the battle against Sisera. And uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, astros, you know, uh, 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 the sun, or even... Other stars, says, you know how big stars are? Of course you do, you know, so that we can understand. We're not talking about physical stars. Only one really has direct effect over our planet here. And definitely did it, it didn't come down here and start fighting against Sisera. It says, from heaven the stars fought, and from their courses they fought against Sisera. How were the stars uh, going to fight against Sisera unless the angel of God, the angels of God, fought in favor of winning a battle that seemed impossible for the children of Israel at that time and stage of their development as a nation, as, as, as an organized people, they won that victory because the angels helped them. God helped them. And the scriptures tell us, though, in Judges 5.20. Okay, now Job, chapter 38, verses 3 to 7. Dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and, and you will make it known to me. In other words, you're a man. We're going to talk like a man. You're going to give me the answers I want, if you are. Okay, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Now, this is God talking to Job, uh, calling him out on the carpet, because Job was forced to justify himself, and he justified himself against his, his friends that were accusing him of evil. And at first it started uh, small, you know, okay, Job, <laughs> we're sorry this happened to you. And then after about seven days, said, wait a minute, this didn't happen for nothing. You've got to have done something wrong. Boom. And Job said, well, no, I've been righteous. Boom, boom. I said, no, that can't be. Because God doesn't work the way. Boom. Well, God did something because here I am. Well, no, you've got to be wrong. And, and it just went bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, God calls Job's friends out. He says, look, you know, they were right on so many things, but not right about Job's case. You know, in general, but they had judged God. That's how. That's what God did, because we've seen this happen before. So, so many of the things they said make sense, but it wasn't the case. That wasn't what God was doing right there with Job. It was a completely different, okay, uh, diff different case. And so they came and they struck on what they knew, and so they were judging God incorrectly. But Job, he was okay at the beginning, but then he started saying, "Well, look." I'm not evil. I'm a good guy. And he concluded that he was all that and a, a bag of rice and a Coca-Cola in the desert. You know, he was, he was it. And God said, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You're both exaggerating now. You, you, you Joe, come here. I got to talk to you. Gird up the loins of your mind. And I'm going to talk to you. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. You're so great. You're so good. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were his bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy before you were created, these morning stars were excited about what God was going to do. They were talking about the angels here. It says, our adversary Lucifer, light bearer is what it, what it means, is described as a star. Helel. <laughs> Helel. The shining one, Helel, that's the Hebrew word, the shining one, a morning star, Lucifer, his very name, shining one, morning star, light bearer. And how you have fallen from heaven, day star, son of the dawn, how you have been thrown down to earth, you who laid low the nation, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, above the other angels. I will erect my throne. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. That's Isaiah 
chapter 14. If you want to read from verses 5 to 19, it talks about the entire fall. Uh, but these are verses 12, to, 12 and 13. So the prophet Daniel referred to the angels as stars. Daniel chapter 8, verse 10. It says it grew strong enough to attack the army of heaven, the stars themselves, and it threw some of them to the ground and trampled them. You can't throw a star to the ground. Do you realize that our sun is a small star in comparison to some of the other stars that are in our galaxy alone? I mean, we know some of the stars that are so huge, but, uh, but our sun, if it was a bank, like a piggy bank, and the earth was a coin, you could fit the earth within our sun, a relatively small star, one million times. I mean, there's no way that a, a star is going to fall to earth. We're talking about these angels, these fallen angels, and the scripture talks about them several times. Okay, Jesus also referred to the angels as stars in Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. The stars, well, it's not talking about meteorites, so we have, we have uh, 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 meteor storms all, all the time. It's not talking about any of that. It says, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. It's talking about fallen angels or demons. Uh, 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 an invasion, a demonic invasion on earth in those days. And so how many angels did Satan take with him when he fell in his rebellion against God? How many angels? Well, we understand that uh, the third of the angels fell with him. And it's interesting that there are only three angels mentioned uh, by name. We have Gabriel, we have Michael, and we have Lucifer. Now, we can get into uh, some... Uh, 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 angelology, or the study about the angels, or about the spiritual realms, uh, pneumatology, uh, and you can debate the different ranks and, and how they were. But it's very possible that all three of those angels are mentioned because they are, in a sense, archangels. They're leader angels, and each one is over a third of the angels. And uh, Lucifer, being one of the named angels, being over a third of the angels, took a third with him. That's a speculation. Uh, take it or leave it, but it's logical to me that the other two uh, are over the other two-thirds of the angels. So anytime there's a demonic attack, they're outnumbered two to one, however you want to take it. But he took a third of the angels, okay? So he took precisely one-third of the angels with him when he fell. And I believe it was the third over which he had authority. You know, he was the leader. There's no doubt that Revelation chapter 12, verse 4 speaks of the angels when it says, His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. He took a third of the angels. A third of the stars. Think about it. So I use this just to present the idea that on that fourth day, we have not only the, uh, the effect of the astros, the, the, the physical stars, but we have the creation of the spiritual stars that are those angels. And the Bible makes reference of them throughout New and Old Testament as angels. Even Christ refers to these angels as stars, as does John in the Revelation. So um, let's uh, continue. We're going to continue to our studies. And I thank you for joining us, joining us in this study. May God continue to bless you and be encouraged in Jesus. Peace. Shalom. Introducing the new Zulon Press book, Is Our Gospel the Gospel? by Dr. Prince Maurice Parker.
Is Our Gospel the Gospel? is available in Christian bookstores and online. Purchase it today.